Wow, what a blessing to see such a full house on a nice day to start a new term. Uh, let me begin by welcoming the Dartmouth College class of 2017 to campus and be w by welcoming back our returning students to another year filled with great opportunities to get involved at the Rockefeller Center. It'll deepen and broaden your understanding of politics and public policy. For those of you who I have not yet met, my name is Andrew Samwick. I'm a professor in the Economics Department and the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center here at Dartmouth. I'd like to point out uh, some of my other staff members who are here. Sadna Hall in the back is the deputy director. She is in charge of all of our co-curricular programs. Uh, that includes public lectures like the ones we'll hear today, the ones we're here, the one we'll hear today, sorry, uh, as well as our leadership, internship, and other programs that focus on activities outside the classroom. We have an associate director, Ron Shiko, who is uh, our associate director in charge of curricular and research programs. There are many opportunities to learn inside the classroom as well. This fall, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the dedication of the Rockefeller Center. There's even a plaque commemorating the event in the entryway upstairs and some memorabilia on display in the Hinman Forum. It's in a glass case on, on the wall up against uh, Silsby. The center honors Nelson Rockefeller, who was a member of the class of 1930, who went on to be one of the most effective governors of the 20th century, serving four terms as governor of New York before becoming vice president. As you might imagine, there's an exhibit upstairs off the Hinman Forum of detailing his time at Dartmouth and his many contributions to public life, which on a single reading would seem to span almost all of public policy. The building and the associated endowments that went with it are wonderful to have, but the real legacy to one of Dartmouth's most prominent alumni is the way we use our resources in pursuit of Dartmouth's mission to prepare students for a lifetime of learning and of responsible leadership. At the founding of the center, Dartmouth's president, David McLaughlin, said, the Rockefeller will succeed only to the extent that it instills in students the love and respect for knowledge and commitment to public service that characterized Nelson A. Rockefeller's life. The real legacy in these three decades is the education, training, and inspiring of that next generation of public policy leaders. One of the ways we do that is to host lectures on a broad range of topics in public policy and the social sciences by leading thinkers and practitioners. If you want to stay informed about our programs and our events, please go to our website, rockefeller.dartmouth.edu, to sign up for news updates via email or your favorite social media platforms. It's a recent tradition at the Rockefeller Center to open the academic year with a program in honor of Constitution Day. The Constitution establishes the government. The government is intimately involved with the public policy outcomes that we study. It was on September 17, 1787, that the delegates to the Constitutional Convention met for the last time to sign the Constitution and present it to the American people. The Constitution is the singular document that guarantees a representative democracy in the United States and has formed the basis for freedoms that we enjoy for over two centuries. It has not been a static document. It's common to hear it referred to as a living constitution or an evolving constitution. If you've been paying attention to the big decisions that have been emanating from the Supreme Court in recent years, you know this evolution is a struggle. To be consistent with founding principles, to frame good law on new and sometimes unanticipated topics, and to overcome what I think are emerging weaknesses in other parts of the government and in the larger society. It is not for amateurs going alone. That's why we're so fortunate today to have an exceptional legal scholar to help us better understand the evolution of the Constitution. In today's discussion, from its creation in Philadelphia to a newer version, maybe version 2.0, that was created in the wake of the Civil War. Annette Gordon-Reed is a member of the Dartmouth class of 1981, where she majored in history and a graduate of Harvard Law School, where she served as an editor of the Harvard Law Review. Staying true to her Hanover and Cambridge educations, she's now professor of law and professor of history at Harvard University, as well as the Carol K. Forsheimer Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She is currently a trustee of the college and previously served on the Dartmouth Alumni Council. She is an educator everywhere you find her. Professor Gordon-Reed is best known as a scholar of Thomas Jefferson 
and many things Jeffersonian. Her scholarship is motivated in many respects by the paradox of how one person could simultaneously write so eloquently about human freedom in the Declaration of Independence while owning slaves as a southern landowner. She is well known in this field for her two books, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, and The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family, which went on to win some 16 book awards, including the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in History. It also won the National Book Award. The original and groundbreaking research on Jefferson, Monticello, and slavery won her a MacArthur Genius Award and a National Humanity, hum, Humanities Medal awarded in 2010. Like the statement of freedom in the Declaration of Independence, many elements of the Constitution reach beyond the ordinary and seem eternal. Like Jefferson, there are many moments in the life of the Constitution that reveal surprising flaws. Both the eternal and the flawed have consequences for all of us. I'm looking forward to a deeper understanding of both. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Annette Gordon-Reed. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. It's such a beautiful day, and I'm impressed to see that you've come indoors uh, to see me on such a beautiful day. Uh, and I would also like to welcome um, the 17s, any 17s here uh, to the, ooh, wow, and you raised your hand. You are indeed 17s. Uh, welcome you to the college. You're going to have a wonderful experience, and, and I, I envy you um, that you're here. I mean, it was a good time when I was here in the 80s, but uh, I think it's even better now. You have the Dartmouth coach, and you can get out occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm told people don't take as much advantage of that as they actually could. Um, but it's great to be here. This is the first time I've ever talked about Constitution Day to anything other than a law school. Um, so this is a, a first for me. Uh, and it's good to see so many different types of faces, not just law students in, in one gathering. And I was thinking about what I would say. I was reminded of a conversation that I had uh, when I was on a television program. Uh, I was waiting in the green room and Chris Matthews, who I'm sure you may have seen, he plays hardball uh, on television. It wasn't hardball, it was his other program. And he mentioned that the president does not talk about the Constitution that much, or doesn't talk about the founders as much as other pres presidents do. And I, I think I've heard the president refer to the founding generation. But I said perhaps one of the differences is that, one of the differences between uh, the president and others is that he focuses more on the Constitution that was created after the Civil War, that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments may be touchstones to him, much more so than what happened at the beginning. Because as was mentioned, uh, the Constitution that we started out with was a wonderful document, but it was a document that was born of compromise, and compromise about a very, very important issue. And the issue, uh, which of course you know, was the issue of slavery. Um, in fact, there are a couple of books that I use now in my classes, one by a man named John, George Van Cleve and another by David Wallstreicher. Both of them emphasize the fact or their belief that the original Constitution, they refer to it as the slaveholders' Constitution, the slaveholders' <laughs> union was created uh, by the American Constitution, and we can talk a little bit about that maybe in the question and answer period. But this was this huge problem that existed for the country from the very, very beginning, and a problem that was patched over, and that eventually led, you know, because of differing people's interpretations of the Constitution, led to the Civil War, and the creation of another vision of what the American Union was about, and that is the union that we live under today, and that we're still struggling uh, to, make, to make more perfect. A lot of this comes about, I think the other thing that makes me, that I think about when I compare the two versions of the Constitution is the way Americans think about the Constitution. I teach criminal procedures, one of the classes that I um, teach in law school, which basically covers the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. Largely the Fourth. We spend much more time on, on the Fourth because that, there are cases every term the, the court and lower courts are dealing with the issue of search and seizure and what <coughs> constitutes an unreasonable search and seizure. In my hometown now of New York City, with stop and frisk, it's a huge question. 
Um, and so here you see the Constitution and interpretations of the Constitution that happen every single day. Uh, lawyers and judges have to interpret it. It drives historians crazy um, because historians, um, that's the historian part of me putting my hat on, um, they see law professors and judges using what they term law office history, that is to say, picking out their particular version of what the Constitution should be about based upon sort of their political views rather than looking at a more historical view of what, what the uh, framers of the Constitution meant. But the Constitution is something that is living to people on a day-to-day -day basis. And Americans, when I, when I talk to my students about this, have a particular view of the Constitution that many, I don't think exists in other countries. Here's one way that Americans may be exceptional. I know you've perhaps heard in the past few days uh, this question about American exceptionalism and whether you know, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, trolling us uh, on this question <laughs> of, uh, about American exceptionalism, baiting, trolling, however you want to call it. Uh, but this is one way, I think, that we are exceptional in the way we view our Constitution. It's a written document that we see almost as a form of, of scripture in a way. Uh, there was a historian who died recently, Pauline Mayer, talked about the, she talked about the Declaration as American scripture. But I think the Constitution comes close to that in the way Americans see it. Um, it's very difficult to amend. You know that. It isn't something that's done lightly. But other countries, France has had many constitutions. They change it quite a bit. And in fact, the thinking was at the time that it would be something that could be changed. Um, not as often as the person whom I write about thought it should be changed. Jefferson thought that the Constitution should be redone every 19 years. How would you think about that? Uh, every 19 years, because he thought every generation, and he counted that as sort of a generation, should make its own rules. That why should you, I think, to some degree, they members of the founders, well here I'm, I'm channeling them now, people always ask me, what would Jefferson have thought, uh, as if I know, um, <laughs> some general idea, but I think Jefferson and some of the other founders would probably be a bit alarmed at the way we revere the Constitution. I mean, we, respect is one thing, but the idea that you can't, that it should be so difficult to change and that people would not be involved in <laughs> thinking of new ways to to change the document or to reform the document to suit our needs, they thought we were going to be involved in it. Instead, it's something that seems, from my view, to be untouchable on the part of, um, that some people view it as untouchable, other than we've, we've amended it 27 times. But there are structural changes, other structural changes that people have suggested that might you know, serve us better. Um, and again, we could talk about that later on. But that's one thing that strikes me about the way people view the Constitution is this document that is almost almost like a sacred text. And as a result, say in the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, what judges do very often is sort of interpret the Constitution, interpret it so hard <laughs> in a way that stretching it beyond all kinds, the language beyond all kinds of uh, what you would typically think the language meant, simply because we can't perhaps don't trust ourselves to go out and figure out, well, if these are the things that you want for search and seizure, let the people decide what they think stop, stop and frisk should be, what they think is an unreasonable search or seizure. But instead of arguing for that, you, we allow courts and judges to interpret the language in ways to try to get us to a point um, through the language that, you know, that the language may not actually bear. So is reverence for the Constitution leads to, well, and, and I'm not saying judicial activism, but it puts it on, it puts the impetus on other people, on law and legal um, <coughs> operatives rather than the people to actually be involved in it. Now, when I ask my students and say, well, you know, would you like to have a constitutional convention? When I raise this as a possibility, if you think that the way judges interpret the Fourth Amendment is sort of out of bounds or something that is so uh, you know, stretching the meaning beyond what it, what it actually could bear, would you be in favor of a constitutional convention? And, <laughs> whoa, you know, people are scared of that on one hand. I'm, I'm saying, you know, that you should, we should think about changing it, but even I sort of pause at the idea that 
we might have a constitutional convention. And people say, well, we could do it, but not now. You know, wait till another administration is in, wait till there's a different political lay of the land before we do it. But it's, it's a very, very complicated question. On one hand, you want, the you want people to be involved, the mechanism for change in the Constitution, amendment process, but also a constitutional convention where we redo the whole thing is always a possibility. States do that all the time, um, revise their constitutions. But there is some hesitancy about doing that with the American Constitution because of the way we view it. Um, and we view it through, I say, I think, through the eyes of the original founders, the people we think of. When you think of founders, you think of James Madison. You think of Hamilton. You think of people. Jefferson wasn't involved with the Constitution. He was in France. I mean, he, you know. <laughs> I mean, he talked to Madison about it. Um, he was also, uh, they talked about the Bill of Rights. Anti-Federalists wanted some sort of assurance that there would be, that, that the people would have certain rights that were definitely um, enumerated. It's that part of the Constitution that I think most people think of, the Bill of Rights, not the actual articles that create the structure of the government. We think of this in terms of the, the rights that were guaranteed for, uh, that were guaranteed. Jefferson supported that, and so he was involved tangentially. But we think of the founders in that generation, not the people who came along after the system broke down, when Southerners said the Constitution gives us the right to maintain slavery, and it definitely does. I mean, there, the word slavery isn't in the Constitution. When they actually read the Constitution the other, what was it, last year they, they started reading the Constitution aloud. They left out. Um, the parts about slavery, obviously they don't exist anymore, but it's sort of, historians would like to have the whole thing out there, to, sh to have the document as it originally was written, uh, with the caveats about what has been taken out. But Southerners could argue this was, these were the terms upon which we came into the Union. And the Constitution favors slavery, and therefore we're right. Northerners said, no, we had another idea. When we made this deal, we thought that slavery would exist in the South, but that it would not. There was no notion that it was going to extend out into the West, which is what really caused the problem between the North and the South, because the question was whether or not this was going to be a nation um, where slavery existed in the South, but new states that came in, the thinking in the North would be that they would be free states. So, both sides felt that the Constitution was on their side, and law broke down, and the only way that it was resolved was with a war. After this, I, another person whom I've written about sort of came into the picture, Andrew Johnson, who is, and my book came out in 2010, and that year was the first year that he actually made it to being the worst president, <laughs> judged to be the worst. He was always in the bottom five, but just, and this, I didn't do this, <laughs> but he was deemed to be the worst um, president uh, that we've had in 2010. Um, Johnson succeeds Lincoln and has a very different understanding about what the Constitution meant uh, and what the new world after the Civil War would pretend for American citizens. And his vision as the president was that the four million people who were freed would exist in the country not as real citizens. He finally came around to the idea that the 13th Amendment was, was a good thing uh, and that slavery should be abolished, but there, there should be no special protection for blacks. So all of the rules that um, the South put in place, rules that were designed, as they said, to put <coughs> things near back to slavery as possible, um, black codes and so forth, uh, People in the North, people in the ra so-called radical Republicans, thought that you would never have protection for the freedmen. You would never be able to rewrite the American story without an amendment to the Constitution. And a man named John Bingham, who most people don't know, um, drafted the 14th Amendment and created the rules about the Privileges and Immunity Clause, the Due Process Clause, uh, the Equal Protection Clause, the words that don't now just apply to African Americans, but apply to all of us. He was responsible for that language. And I would say most, how many people have heard of John Bingham? 
Just a, a few people have heard about John Bingham. A handful of people here have heard about John Bingham, and he was somebody who I think of as a founder, as a, a, a sort of a part of the new founders, the people who came uh, in the 1860s who wrote a new story for the American for the American nation. There is now a book about him by a man named Gerard Magliocchi. I think you may pronounce his last name. I'm probably butchering that, but he is a founder that I think people should know just as much as we think about Madison and Jefferson and those people as founders. The people who wrote this new story I think should be known to Americans as well. And I'm sure you know the story from there even though the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment uh, came to became part of the Constitution. After the North left the South with the Compromise 1876, they pulled the troops out of, of, the, uh, of the South. Southerners went back to sort of doing, trying to do what they had been doing before uh, with, the, with the population of African Americans there in the South. Um, Plessy v. Ferguson, the sort of Jim Crow, the rules that, for segregation. Uh, lynching became uh, a part of the norm uh, in the South. It hadn't been before, obviously, when blacks were property and belonged to, black, to other whites then this sort of wanton killing was not the order of the day. But once that ended, um, there was a lot of a torrent of violence that was unleashed against, um, against African Americans. So the Constitution provided protections on paper, but when there was no power enforced in the South to make the words of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, the spirit of those amendments actually come uh, into play, it was very, very difficult um, for, um, near impossible, I would say, um, for the actual law, the meaning of law. Law has to be enforced. I mean, things could be put on paper, but if there's no force to make it happen, then it's almost meaningless. And I think one of the reasons that people don't think of this uh, era or the Civil Rights era, excuse me, the uh, Civil War amendments as creating a new founding was for many decades, the South was very much allowed to write its own story about what had happened in Reconstruction. Reconstruction uh, was seen as a period for many years in history as a terrible time of what they would have called Negro rule. People were, whites were downtrodden and were sort of dominated by blacks. That was the story that was told um, from Reconstruction. So history and historians created, I think, it was called the Dunning School, named for a group of historians who, um, mainly from Columbia University, who wrote the story of Reconstruction as this awful, terrible time. So on one hand, you have the founding, the 1780s, after, you know, after 1776, winning, uh, you know, kicking the British out, um, taking over from the mother country. That's a positive story. The story about compromise that I told you that was problematic, um, didn't come to the fore. The, the normal spirit, I'm thinking about the original Constitution, is something that's good. Reconstruction uh, was seen as something that was awful for many, many years. If you read the history books, as I said, from the Dunning School, the notion that giving blacks the vote, giving blacks an opportunity to participate in the government was seen as this nightmare, portrayed as this nightmare, I think colored the way people viewed uh, the men who crafted um, not only that, but the Civil Rights Act, not only the Civil War Amendments, but the Civil Rights Act, all these attempts to bring blacks into citizenship, it colored the way people viewed that. And so we can't, it was, I, I understand why people would not celebrate that time period in the same way, because it was portrayed as this very, very awful period. We have sort of a reworking of that. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote Black Reconstruction, and it was his vision to try to set the record straight, saying, wait a minute, <clears throat> many of the people who participated in Reconstruction, these were people who were not illiterate. They knew how to read. They knew how to read and write. It wasn't a matter of black rule. It was just that these were people who had been former slaves. They had been oppressed, and the wheel had turned, and now they were in positions of power. 
and the people who had owned them before <coughs> were necessarily upset about seeing them in that position. So Du Bois begins to change the story. <coughs> Excuse me, I have allergies. Um, du Bois began to change the story. And then Eric Foner, later on, another historian, ironically enough, at Columbia, writes Reconstruction and sort of details clearly what had happened during that time period. And things began to change. People had a different view about Reconstruction. So we're in a position now, I think, for people to think positively about what happened during that time period. And of course, all history is written very much with the preoccupations of the time, sort of <coughs> over the shoulder of the historian. Foner and, and, well, Du Bois before him and Foner were writing during a time period when there was, with, with, I guess with Du Bois, a sort of nascent civil rights movement. And Foner is writing at a time period when the quest for black rights was very, very much, you know, au courant. So it wasn't, <coughs> it wasn't a problem to suggest that African Americans should have been a part of of the, the sort of American power, you know, power structure that they deserve the vote and they deserve to be treated as equal citizens. So now we're in a position, I think, to honor these people, um, people like John Bingham, Thaddeus Stevens, people who you, whom you see now, who uh, I guess Lincoln uh, sort of brought many of these people to the fore, the abolitionists. Uh, there was a, a documentary not long ago on PBS about the abolitionists, people who were thought of, written of, as crazy people who sort of formed the basis of, of the movement um, for black rights during the 1860s and the anti-slavery movement and then the freedom, uh, the movement for black rights after that, these people now are being treated as if they were heroes. So there may come a time, not likely, <laughs> there may come a time when people who were sort of how do you say it, premature uh, advocates of black rights or whatever, people who were the sort of precursors to <coughs> the modern civil rights movement will be as honored as maybe Madison and Jefferson? Probably not, but more in that direction that people will see their contributions as creating a founding as well. Um, I think what has to happen, of course, is that there have to be more people doing books about these people. You know, I mean, I think uh, the biography of Bingham will be good. Uh, Lincoln, probably, the movie Lincoln, I don't mean Lincoln himself, but the movie Lincoln brought a lot of people that folks did not know um, into, into public view. Uh, I guess Tommy Lee Jones playing somebody. Uh, actually gives a lot of attention and people and people came to me and they, people said, you know, I didn't know anything about him and I actually looked him up. So it has to be much more part of a popular conscience, that, uh, popular conscious to bring these people uh, to the public's view and make the Constitution not just about what happened 1787, what happened after ratification 1789, all of the things that have happened, the steps that we've taken to sort of make it a much, a more, uh, a more perfect union. I was talking not long ago um, to someone about the Declaration, not long ago, it was a student here at Dartmouth who was interviewing me about this, um, about the Declaration versus the Constitution. You know, why, why is it Constitution Day as well known? I guess it was, what was it, it was, it was another holiday before, citizen's holiday, citizenship holiday before it was the Constitution Day. Why isn't as revered or as celebrated as July 4th? Well, July is good for barbecues, I, I suppose. Um, the Declaration is a foundational document of American law. It establishes the break from Great Britain. It's the beginning of a country. It's, and the words of it, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal you know the words. Every group of, every person, every group that tries to make it into, into sort of an equal place, a, 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 a safe space in, Amer in American polity, used those words. First it was African Americans, 
I was telling the student that I talked to a colleague who is doing a, um, a paper about the Declaration, about how people received it at the very, very beginning, who used the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And at first it was not surprisingly African American people who fastened on that language um, as, as a way of saying, hey, wait a minute, what about us? Then you know the story as well. African American people use it. Women have used it uh, as a way of suggesting that women deserve to have equal rights uh, as Americans. Uh, immigrant groups, LBGT community has used these words. Uh, and it, it's a, it evokes a certain kind of spirit. The Constitution has great words, but it's, it's law. <laughs> it's, it's, it is to be interpreted. I have to say <coughs> that not as many people in the world like our Constitution as much as they like the Declaration. I mean, the Declaration is everywhere. All kinds of groups have looked to it. Uh, to establish their right to freedom. The Constitution, not as much. Um, people don't like the structure uh, as much. Other countries have not adopted it in the same sort of way. So the Constitution is not as, I don't want to use the term sexy maybe, as the Declaration of Independence. What's another word for it? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same spirit, I think, in, in the same way. So I, I think celebrating Constitution Day will be an important thing, but it's not going to be the Declaration because the Declaration, as I said, it's the beginning of, of the country and that has a spe and the words that Jefferson uses have a special resonance to people that people think it describes not only what happens for a country, but it's something that happens for individuals as well. But the Constitution is important because it is a way of binding people to the nation. It is a way for us to think about our rights on a day-to-day -day basis. As I said, when you walk down the street, if a policeman says something to you, if a policeman stops you, all of us, whatever, anytime we have an encounter with government, the Constitution is implicated. People think of it mainly in legalistic terms, um, and it doesn't, it affects us every single day, but it isn't it isn't philosophical, I think, in the way the Declaration is. So I think that Constitution Day is important and will remain important. As a lawyer, certainly, I'm all in favor of people looking at legal documents and interpreting them. Um, the Declaration is much more loosey and, and airy, and, and, and I love the words uh, of it. Uh, the Constitution has a different ring for us, a different set of, of importance for it, uh, for all of us. But I think it primarily reminds us of our duties as citizens. I think that even if I'm not as keen on this notion of a constitutional convention, I am much more keen on people paying more attention to the document and understanding that we make it. I don't think we should have to do it every 19 years to redo it, but I do think that it is our responsibility to participate in this democracy. And having it written down, unlike it is in Great Britain, can give us guidance about what it is we can do to help further the American experiment along. I mean, we are create, it was designed to create a more perfect union, and this is something that we're still working on uh, every single day. And I think events like this, any time that we pause to remember you know, how the document came into existence, what it's supposed to mean, and to think about what it means for us <coughs> is always important. Now, I'm told I'm supposed to stop around this time, um, and take questions for you, and I'm very happy to do that. <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also instructed to tell you, I have a note here, please wait for the microphone before asking your question. And, you know, and I should say I will answer questions about anything, uh, Constitution Day, the Constitution, Tom and Sally, um, <laughs> whatever. There's someone down here. Is already on? Hi. Yes. Um, uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, and you are? I'm Adam. I'm a, a senior, so I'm a 14. Okay, great. I'm not a government major, but I did take a couple classes in the government department. Um, okay. It's been great. Um, also, I just want to throw in this tidbit. Um, 
I totally aced my eighth grade final paper uh, because of your work on the relationship between Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson, I'm glad which to I be cited heavily. And I'd like to think that that has um, played a, not a small role in helping me eventually make it here to Dartmouth. So thank you very much for that. Um, my question is, uh, well, there's a lot of talk recently about the problem um, of gridlock in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering uh, if you had any perspective on whether there is a constitutional solution um, for the ongoing problems in our legislative branch. Well, I think part of the problem, well, this is one of the, the structure of government, when I mentioned before that other countries aren't too thrilled with the structure, that it's designed to create checks and balances. But we seem to have sort of gone too far with that. The remedy for that, one remedy for that is that, is that I suggested at the end, I think people, if people didn't want this, if we didn't want this, things could be different. If we participated, if people voted, if people were active in the political process, it seems that the American people want divided government. I mean, people say, we, we like the idea, when they do polls, I don't know, polls, unskew the polls, that we call or whatever, I mean, to the extent that you trust them, suggest that people like to have the one office in the, under the control of one party and another office under the control of other parties, because they think that it's going to make people, you know, that it's going to slow things down. So we seem to want this in a way. Um, the only way out of it is, is what we, is, is, our, is the way is we participate and, and call a halt to it. I, I really do think that we hold the key to a lot of, the solution to a lot of problems in our own hands. It just seems to be what people want. It's like we don't trust, you don't want, you don't want the, the government to be all Democratic, you don't want the government to be all Republican. It's, people seem to see some virtue in this, but it, ha it does cause a problem because we really, there are a lot of problems that have to be solved. And you may like, th like it in theory, but it has some real world applications, and real world problems uh, uh, with, the, with the sort of divided government. So I, I think, I mean, certainly redistricting, where people are gerrymandered into districts so that they're safe and so they can be as crazy as they want to be. Um, that's a problem, but I, I think that these are things that we could, we could work on. If you wanted to break that, nobody, if you really wanted to break the gridlock, I think the American people could do it, voters could do it, but I don't think we have the will uh, to do it. We don't seem to have the will to do it because we, as I said, like the idea of the checks and balances. And if you like it, that's what you get, but mainly checks. In the blue, you have to hand it over to him. Uh, hi, I'm Jake Greenberg. I'm a 17, so mm -hmm. uh, go easy on me. Um, do you think when you talked about the Constitution as kind of the scripture that it somewhat paralyzes or stagnates our legal process and that we leave it up to academia and law professors and like judges? Well, to nothing's decide? left up to law professors. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody listens to us. Um, that's not quite true. In some fields, they do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there's too much of a reliance on judges or even the people who are supposed to be our representatives. You vote for, for people as representatives and senators, but that, does, that, should not be the end, that should not be the end of the process. You should be letting, we should be letting our feelings be known, uh, participating in the process, voting people out when they don't do what we want, working with, sort of trying to persuade other people. This is maybe Pollyanna-ish at this point <laughs> to think that we could, well, persuasion is still possible, I think. I mean, you have to make the attempt. But I do think that seeing it as something that is sacred and that you, you don't touch it and, you know, we, you know, structurally it's hard to, to amend the process. But I mean, I think people not being involved and not making the effort <coughs> makes it easy for people to sort of continue on. Gridlock continues and sort of putting it off to other people, to experts to handle problems is not, not the way to go. It should be, 
I'm not totally sure about what is called popular constitutionalism. Larry Kramer, who used to be the um, uh, dean at Stanford Law School, has written a book about popular constitutionalism, sort of exhorting the people to understand that we make the Constitution and that our voices should be heard and we should be writing to people, we should be participating and doing all those kinds of things. Um, I think that I'm along that continuum, thinking that he's right in this way. But certainly, the notion of, of the Constitution as scripture and something that has to be interpreted by wise men and women um, is not, I don't think it is not the way to go. Um, someone, a, a non student. He's got it back here. <coughs> Professor Ryder Masters from the Government Department. I'd like to thank you very much for your very wise words, particularly uh, at the end, your remark that the Constitution is a way of binding the people to the nation. Mm -hmm. I think that's very profound and very true, and it gives rise to a real puzzle that I've had, which is the responsibility uh, of a particular group, which is my colleagues who are professors of government. <laughs> Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States." End quote. Mm -hmm. There can be no question that health is part of welfare, and public health is part of public welfare. One political party has claimed that that law is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. This Article 1, Section 8 clearly makes that constitutional. And when the Republicans said that the mandate was a tax, they admitted it was constitutional. And yet, I'd like to know, was there one professor of constitutional law in the United States who spoke up to the relevance of that passage to that law? Not that I know of specifically, no. But I do know that there are, well, Larry Tribe said it was a tax and that it was allowable and that that. Oh, I, I mean the specific words. Oh, the specific words of it. No, no, I, I don't think he used those specific words. But he predicted what Roberts was going to do even, you know, months before then. But you're right. I mean, I think I have not heard anybody use that language um, because people sort of assume you know, if you're, the notion of a mandate, you can make me eat broccoli. I mean, it was sort of, there were these sort of side issues and side tangents that I think took people away from thinking about things specifically, and we never got really on track with it. Your next door neighbor having a constitutional disease is not even broccoli. <laughs> that if professors fail to do their job, professors, mm -hmm. we're the ones who are supposed to do that. We didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I, I think, I don't know about people using that specific language, but I do think that people, well, professors did not, let me put it this way, professors were so sure, I think, law professors were so sure, myself included, that this is obviously interstate commerce, that they thought that this was a no-brainer, but it turned out to be, we were wrong about that. So I think, that it just seemed so clear that this impacted interstate commerce, that that was, you know how you fixate on you, the answer that you think it is? Of course. And people laughed at the idea. I mean, uh, my colleagues, and, and I read legal blogs and discussions that I had with people, of course. But it just never occurred to us. And this is our failing. You know, I mean, lawyers are supposed to anticipate everything. You know, all the, <laughs> the worst case scenario. I think people were fixated on that, the commerce argument, thinking that this was the way it was going to be, and that wasn't, there wouldn't be a problem. Try, Larry said it would be a tax, so they didn't fixate on, on that part of it. But that is something that needs to, should be brought to the fore. Hi, I'm Emma 
McDermott. I'm a 14 at Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. I'm a government major. And I think what you said about the scripture was very interesting. Re recently, Justice Scalia mentioned how he has this reverence for the founding generation. He thinks mm -hmm. there's genius in that generation. And you mentioned in your speech how you think if there's more attention paid to the post-war generation, mm -hmm. that that would sort of bring some light to what it is you were talking about. Do you think if these individual biographies become more in the present consciousness, would that bring more flexibility to the way people interpret things? We'd have less strict constructionists in constitutional law? Well, I don't think it's going to change. We're going to have strict constructionalists in, in constitutional law. I think history, and I'm saying this, and I'm a person who's supposed to be doing a two-volume biography of Jefferson. Um, <laughs> We need to write about people other than Jefferson. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, other than that crew. I mean, it's, it's irresistible because it's a, it's a great thing they achieved. You know, creating a country, uh, it's, an, it's a momentous thing. And I understand the focus on them. And he, in particular, has so many more interesting things about him than just the politics. So there are reasons to be interested in them. But we should, our understanding of who, who are founders, there's a movement now, people talk about black founders, people who were involved in the 1780s and 1790s, uh, James Fortin, people who are, you know, who are trying to participate, bring blacks and other people into, um, into the mix. Um, there's no question that there needs to be, we need to branch out a bit more, and historians are doing that. History from, I mean, history from the bottom up has been something that's been going on a while. But now people are relating it much more, not just writing about individual obscure people just for the sake of doing that, but people are suggesting how those people actually contributed to the founding as well. It's not just great man history. Great man history is fine. You've got to tell the story of those people as well. But history is about what lots of different people are doing at this moment. So I do think that there's, you're not going to, I don't know how, what effect it will have on Supreme Court justices, uh, but I do think that telling a broader story of the American origins, <coughs> the American founding, is something that will be good for the, the citizenry as a whole, because it's more realistic. I mean, there was not, there were more than just a, you know, a handful of people who made all of this. There were lots of people who made it. So we have to tell all of those stories. Oh, you? You're gonna, you, you wanna? Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Proximity. <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, my name is Mako Quad Jones. I'm a 14, um, Gov minor, mm -hmm. Native American Studies major. And one thing that I've been trying to learn um, is Native American peoples within the context of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm studying federal Indian policy and law, but um, regardless of that, I recently read notes on the state of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson talking about Aboriginal people in Virginia, and I guess my, my curiosity and my question is about um, as Native peoples try to establish our nations as the Constitution recognizes as a foreign nation while in the context of self-determination, um, how back to this question, how did the founders view that, you know, as how do, where are we at now, I guess, as, you know, if we're going back to the Constitution, recently with baby Veronica case and everything being um, in the mainstream, how would me as a student of studying um, Native American nation building, you know, respect and carve out our space within the constitutional right that we have in Section 1, Article 8. Um, you know, how did the founders see tribal peoples? You know, we've well, said, we've, we heard a lot about the history of it, but how did the founders view that and put that in the Constitution? Well, the founders' view of, well, I can't speak for all of the founders, uh, not a good view. <laughs> That's an understatement of the of the century. Um, I think Native peoples, it's pretty clear Native peoples were seen as a problem. And certainly from Jefferson's perspective, it would be, they would, Native Americans would either, would either assimilate or be destroyed. That, that was simply it. I mean, unlike, I mean, he had a notion that 
you would get land by buying it, purchasing, and you know that William Henry Harris. I mean, that the people he sent out to do those kinds of things. But if push came to shove, they'd be shoved. Um, that would that was the answer. So it was either intermarriage and disappear, or you know he thought that that they would be killed. That that would be the the end of it. So I don't think. Thinking of his vision, I don't think that he thought, would imagine <coughs> Indian nations existing within America for a long period of time. That it would just, it would be, as I said, assimilation or they would die out. That was essentially it. Um, because I mean, he certainly, and, and other members of the founders' generation certainly thought uh, we would, the country would be moving west and that that was the destiny that that was what was going to happen. So it's a very, well, as you, I don't have to tell you, it's an incredibly problematic issue. I mean, for enslaved people, for blacks, it was different because there was no notion of assimilation was possible. I mean, you, if you've seen the notes and he's saying, you know, emancipation has to be followed by expatriation because blacks and whites can't live together in peace, um, he essentially says that we're ne whites will never give up. We're never going to give up our prejudices against blacks, and blacks will never forgive us for what we've done. And so, there was no notion of that. But for him, Native Americans, there was a possibility because he romanticized Native Americans. I mean, notes on the state of Virginia is essentially a uh, an answer to. French naturalists who said that everything in the United States degenerated. Anything native in America degenerated. Animals, all kinds of things. And so this was his bid to say, that's not true. We have Native American people here, and they haven't degenerated, and blah, 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 blah. So you know, he had a reason for uh, uh, his romanticism and you know, romantic if you call it that, about Native Americans, but African Americans were a bigger problem. So I, I don't think that they, I thought that the vision was that they were not going to, either they're going to be, you know, he says, you know, our blood will run in your veins or whatever and vice versa, or you'll be killed, <laughs> this essentially was the vision. Zach, I'm a 16, um, Gov Major, Pub Paul Minor. Um, I was wondering, um, the president has a lot of critics um, that say, you know, as a constitutional scholar, he doesn't really follow the Constitution with things like Obamacare, with things like drone warfare, with things like NSA surveillance. Um, and I was wondering, um, from your perspective, how do you think public officials in general, um, with a background in law or constitutional law, how they should approach um, decision making in general? Um, what kind of effect do you think having that background has? Um, and if you think it's fair to apply this kind of extra scrutiny um, to those scholars for having that background. Uh, extra scrutiny, well, it is interesting having a president who taught con law. I think realistically, once a person becomes a president, uh, the, their, under, their relationship to power, whatever they know about the Constitution, this is a very small fraternity, and in so far it has been a fraternity. And uh, the notion of giving up power to be the person in that office who takes power away from the presidency in any way is not something that I think presidents are want to do. Um, and so whatever he thought about things ahead of time, once you're in that office, you're thinking about legacy and you're thinking about, well, am I going to leave this office weaker? take things away from the president. I was a little surprised at his asking Congress about Syria because that kind of takes away. I mean, he says, you know, I can strike anyway, <laughs> even if you say no, but that's problematic. Um, it would be, you know, I, I thought for certain he would just say, well, I'll, I'll make the decision because that's what presidents have done up until this point. So it's, there are all kinds of things that you can think when you're a con law professor before you're president and once you get in that office you think about 
what the office means. All of the, the you know, all of the little sticks, and well, I'm a property professor too, sticks in the bundle of rights, sticks, all the, the tools in the president's arsenal, I think most presidents want to preserve. So I, I, it was, I, it never occurred to me that, I didn't think that he would, um, he could be mindful of his constitutional duties. He understands, he knows what's in the Constitution, but presidents act sort of like presidents. You know, I mean, in terms of power, people in power act like people in power. Um, so it's, I don't, and I don't, but I don't think that it's wrong to hold him to a standard uh, because of this, uh, to sort of think about it, but it ha you have to be realistic about it. Um, he's not going to give up power unless, you know, he, he's going to be loath to give up power unless there's a political reason to do so. And the political reason, I suppose, in this setting was that it kind of let him off the hook, you know, if he doesn't want to do it. Um, and so now you buy time and we may have some other sort of agreement and he sort of doesn't have to, you know, stick to the line in the sand that he drew. A red line, what was it? Did he say red line? Something like that. Hi, uh, Josh, 17. Um, you mentioned, sort of asking you as the history professor, um, you mentioned the movie Lincoln earlier and um, one of the sort of controversies as I understand it in the movie was the method that President Lincoln used to um, sort of get the votes necessary to pass the amendments. And um, looking at the two presidents who are most prominent in the, uh, the Civil War and then the Civil Rights Movement, you know, Lincoln and Lyndon B. Johnson. Lyndon B. Johnson was also known as sort of sometimes intimidating <laughs> senators and, yeah, exactly, you know, <laughs> all these um, But yet they, um, the cause that they were trying to achieve was so you know, morally good. Do you think that this is a, that was sort of a, those cases were sort of Machiavellian where we can say the ends justify the means, or do you think that the way that they went about these things should still, should um, degrade the image that we have of them? Because, you know, Lincoln is held in such a high esteem, Lyndon B. Johnson not so much, but um, mm -hmm. uh, still, you know, do you think that should in any way affect their image? Well, um I think in, in the Lincoln, the way it's portrayed in, in Lincoln, it, it was done to sort of humanize him in a way. Instead of him sort of waving his hand and, you know, the clouds part and the light comes down on everybody and they all do what they're supposed to do. They got to twist arms and do all kinds of crazy things. So I think for, I think comparing the two, for Lincoln, the, the portrayal in the movie made him look like a human being. And so I think the way people responded to that was, I don't think that it made people think, no one I talked to, or I said it maybe other people, but I didn't get the impression that it would make people think less of him. It just made him look like a human being, which he hasn't looked like for a very long time, you know, Father Abraham. Uh, Johnson, on the other hand, uh, well, all the arm twisting and you know getting in people's faces and talking to people while he's in the bathroom, all those kinds of things, um, you know, bullying people. I don't. It's he. He doesn't need to be humanized. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, he he appears as the the er human. I mean, he is human in 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 all its flaws and greatness and all those kinds of things. So I think it has a different understanding about it. Lincoln, it sort of brings down to uh, brings him down to earth. Um, but I think it's, it's a realization that that's what politics involves. It's, you know, giving people, it's quid pro quo. Um, giving people what they want and getting something in return for it. Um, so I, I don't think it diminishes. I just think that people realize that that's, that's the nature of, of, of the beast that you have to do. It's horse training. Hi, my name is Brandon. I'm a 16 economics and government double major. Um, I think it was George Washington who said that the Constitution was written only for a holy, moral, and religious people. And with the church becoming less and less influential um, in many ways in the public sphere, do you see that as a problem for our government? For the church being? Uh, in, in some ways becoming less influential, mm -hmm. at least in the public sphere. No, I, you know, I don't think it's a problem because, I, you know, again, this is the, the uh, I'm not a Jeffersonian, but I think the one thing that, that I 
well, the, one of the things that I admire most about him is um, the insistence on the separation of church and state, not as a way of making um, religion disappear, but of preserving it. I mean, because we have this notion, we are, of all industrialized nations, the United States is by far the most religious um, country. Um, it's, and it's because we don't have an, an established church that religious denominations, I'm, I'm a United Methodist, all kinds of different denominations can flourish. So I don't, I don't think of it as a problem um, because it allow, it's the only way to allow, I think, for religious you know, pluralism, for individual conscience among um, you know, different groups of people. So it, it hasn't really hurt us. I mean, Europe, when you go to, to England on Sundays, I've been to church in, in England on Sunday. It's a lonely thing. Uh, not, not to say that people don't go to church in England, they do, but uh, not like us. It's, it's the par it's, people might see that as a paradox, that because we've tried to keep these things apart, generally, in fact, it's allowed religion to, to flourish among people among individuals. Getting back to some of the things you said earlier. Getting back to some of the things you said earlier, you um, mentioned your hesitancy of uh, another constitutional convention, and you talked about gridlock in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it isn't the system you know, it isn't the Constitution, it's rather that the people are gridlocked. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, maybe we have the best Constitution we can have given that situation. Mm -hmm. um, one example, and I gotta go back and get my um, source, but um, I read an article that said, even if we straightened out gerrymandering, which is always thrown out as an example, it wouldn't matter. It would only shift like eight votes. Mm -hmm. So it's not a good thing, but um, I'm just wondering if, you know, the country itself is, um, you know, at a gridlock stage. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have a, a colleague, he's a, well, actually he's at the University of Texas and he teaches at Harvard as well, Sanford Levinson, who very regularly basically says the Constitution is a disaster. The American Constitution is a disaster. I mean, you know, we can re revere it all at once, but it is not, it's an 18th century doctrine, uh, document that is not really equipped, he says, to deal with 21st century problems. Um, and we need to do something different. And I, I think I was sort of alluded to that before when I said that people seem to want divided government. People seem to want this. And I don't quite know why. Um, well, it's a big country. It may be that it's too large, too diverse. I mean, the whole, Madison thought, it originally believed with Montesquieu that you could not have a republic that was too large, that it had to be something small so that people could participate. Uh, and then Madison changes, Federalist 10, he says, you know, now that they're going to have a big country, he says, oh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> you can't have it. Uh, uh, you can't have it uh, because it's, it's big and you will not have one faction that captures everything, uh, you know, captures the whole process. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's a lot of 300 million people, very diverse country, very different interests, changing all the time. I, I, mean, I like to think that we can make it work and we are making it work, but Maybe we're, the Constitution exists to bind us, but maybe we're not bound enough. We're very, very, there's some sharp differences, differences of, of opinion. The whole debate about health care has exposed that in lots of ways. That here is an entrance, a, a, a situation where I don't think people are opposing something because they think it's not going to work. It may be opposed because they think it will work, and that there's a differing philosophy about the way, the relationship between government and citizens. And 
it's a big, people don't want to be European. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's the fear, is that we are not European, and that may be the way they do things, uh, but that's not how we do things. And so there's a, there are real sharp divides among the people, and uh, it's something that we have to, that we'll have to, we'll have to work out. Now, I should say sharp divide among people who are actually participate, people who vote. Mm -hmm. A lot of people feel alienated from the process altogether. And so we don't really hear their voices. And you could say, well, that's their fault. If they, if they want to be involved, they could. But there are, there's a lot to sort out right now. So I think it, we could be, we're gridlocked as, as a people trying to decide which fork in the road, cliche or whatever, which direction we're going to go in. And if you're suggesting if the people had a better, a clearer idea, or different idea, politics would be different. And I, I think that may be right. It, it could be us. It, it, it's the system of checks and balances. I will say this, and maybe this is, maybe I was too young to really know what was going on. What strikes me is what's happening today seems a little bit different because I get the idea that there are people who would be willing to hurt the country to make a political point. And I don't think that that was true. That didn't, see, you know, it didn't seem to be true from even people like Nixon and Nixon and Johnson. And I mean, we had, we passed some really big Medicare legislation on a bipartisan basis before. So something has happened. It could be the people have changed, but certainly politi politics have changed in ways that. Uh, I, you know, I, I can't pretend to know the origin of it, but it just strikes me as different now. Um, and that could be the people or, or the people who are, who are re-electing. Do you have a question? So I think part of the problem is that people have learned. They've learned how to exploit the weaknesses of a governing framework. Mm -hmm. that was set up by genius, but even genius has a has sort of a shelf life. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's always been gerrymandering, but it's particularly acute now, mm -hmm. because every time it happens, that sets it up to happen even worse the next time. Mm -hmm. So Republicans sort of swept into power at the state level, mm -hmm. and they get to write the, the rules about how the districts are assigned, and they've become very good at gerrymandering. If you look at uh, healthcare, we've had 40 odd years to look at what it looks like with Medicare. Mm -hmm. And so we've learned what we like and what we don't like. And it's less of an experiment and more of an appeal to things we think we already know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might go back and run the experiment. If you knew now about Medicare, what you currently know, and you went back and thought about passing Medicare, I wonder if you could have passed it then on bipartisan terms if you knew how it was going to turn out, both because it turned out better than you thought mm -hmm. and for other people because it turned out worse than you thought. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just an element of learning against any fixed set of rules mm -hmm. that makes those rules work less and less well over time. Mm -hmm. So I asked you a question. Um, so what do you do? What, are um, what would you suggest people do in the face of that? I mean, we've had this learning experience. So you, you used to have the problem of unequal representation because state constitutions were modeled after the federal constitutions mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court just sort of struck it down and some people in your profession uh, basically said that was the court usurping power that it didn't have mm -hmm. uh, and other people said there was no other way. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately I think we just keep pushing this off on the Supreme Court to be the uber legislature. Yeah. So I, you asked me a different question. The answer I gave you is what I think will happen, mm -hmm. not I think what should happen. Well, what should happen? Well, people should be rational and they should come together <laughs> for the greater good. <laughs> but if you can't even come together in Congress, there's no way you can come together in a constitutional convention. Mm -hmm. So at some point, the only thing that's going, that should happen is what's going to happen, which is that you hope that the Supreme Court is populated by thoughtful people and that when they do usurp, which 
is the history that we're we're continuing, they do so in sensible ways. <laughs> I don't, I don't think there's some, mm -hmm. I'm not clever enough to come up with a better idea mm -hmm. than what's actually going to happen. Well, it's sort of interesting. I mean, the, the role of the court in all of this, in the Constitution, because that too, I think, is something that probably would have, I mean, maybe Marshall could in, would have anticipated it, um, you know, the power that the court has um, to be the arbiter of, because Jefferson thought that every section, every branch could determine whether or not something was constitutional. That it shouldn't, I mean, the idea that you would leave it to the court uh, to, uh, to make this decision, and that's one of the interesting things about it. We go, we go along with it. You know, I mean, that's the, the power that this, uh, it's the best job in the world. Um, you know, the court has. that They make a pronouncement and people say, you know, all right, for the most part, I mean, there, there are ways of circumventing it, but just in general, you don't, people don't march on Washington and, you know, try to take things over when the court has spoken. For the most part, people abide by it. But um, it's hard to know what to do in a country this large, uh, this country this diverse. I mean, that we get along as well as we do is sort of interesting. Um, I mean, it could be, you know, that's not a ringing endorsement, it could be much worse, but, you know, it's, it's a cumbersome kind of thing, and we do manage to, uh, to go forward to some degree. I'm Vince Puzak, I'm a 17, and I was wondering your opinion as a constitutional scholar on whether the Electoral College should be abolished and what should it be replaced with. Wow. <laughs> no, I don't think it should be abolished. Um, I think it preserves, well, I go back and forth. <laughs> I go back and forth on it. It preserves some sense of, well, it, it's in keeping with the system of, of union that you know, we created a nation, but it's, it's a union of differing people. And if we all voted just based on the popular election, what happens to, what's the purpose of states at that point? Now, I often ask myself that. <laughs> what is the purpose of state? Uh, but that's kind of the, the federal system. That's the kind of system that we have. Um, and the Electoral College, I think, preserves the sort of original understanding of how the states came together to form a union. Uh, I know it's exasperating because you think whoever gets the most votes ought to win. Um, but again, that this is my conservatism. I mean, the fact that I don't want a constitutional convention, you're asking me to get rid of the Electoral College. Uh, I would, I way towards saying no, we, sh we should keep it, even with the, the flaws. Chuck Sherman, uh, class of 66. Mm -hmm. um, another way we're different from European countries. Are we stuck with the Second Amendment and the occasional mass shooting? Are we stuck with the Second Amendment? Yes, we are. Afraid so. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> I'm from Texas, but go ahead. <laughs> Hi, um, Paul Vance, an alumni parent. Big investment in this school. Uh, <laughs> the uh, public pol the foreign policy of the United States is to encourage democracies, and we've been watching this experiment, the Arab Spring. You've talked about the difficulties and the compromise of setting a social compact in the United States. Is it possible that these nascent democracies will find a constitution or a social compact or whatever that will endure 20 years as opposed to 200, 400 years? Ooh. I think it's possible. I think one of the advantages that Americans had in, in the American experiment is that 
they were, it was a colony, it was a colony that had really governed itself for a long time. You know, I mean, they'd had, they had over a century worth of experience of local government, of local institutions that were put in place. I mean, the, the mother country was there, but they were in Virginia, you know, the House of Burgesses, I mean, and, you know, Massachusetts, the General Court. I mean, they had institutions that were in place. So what you really did, I mean, people question, people talk about whether or not the American Revolution was a revolution at all, because basically the same people who were in charge were in charge after it was over. They just got rid of the British and stuck with their own institutions. Um, to the extent that these countries have, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's an I'm, I'm saying that's an advantage that we had. So these, I think people have to form uh, institutions <coughs> sort of on the fly or either use ones that are in place, and that's why many of them you turn to sort of religious institutions as something to, you know, to hold on to. I think they can, but it's, it's going to be difficult. I, I think the expectation that this could be overnight um, or done quickly is not realistic for the reason that I said. I mean, we were able to do that. America was able to do that because there were decades and decades of, of functioning institutions that people just kind of kept going when it was over. Made a few changes. The House of Burgesses, you know, they all of a sudden it's the, it, it, you know, it's the Virginia. It's the legislature, different type of legislature, different way of, of, um, of, of, of constituting it, but essentially familiar. So I think they can do it, but I, it can't be overnight, and it will have to be based upon hooked to the culture itself, things in the culture. They can't import something from some other place and, and put it on as a template. I mean, we can, I, I, people go over and advise people. I had a colleague who advised um, people on the Iraqi inst uh, uh, constitution, but it has to come from the people themselves and sort of tapping into whatever structures they have to try to build up, if, if, if it's going to be democratic, their own sense of what that means. Uh, but it's hard. Um, and I, I do think that it, it just doesn't make sense for people to say, well, hey, this is what we did, and they can do it. They can do it, but it has to be in their own way. And it will take, it'll take time. Hi, um, I'm Anna. I'm a 14 Gov major. Um, and I have a question, I guess, somewhat or that one of the things that you talked about, which I find interesting, is that we've spent a lot of time talking about how um, the U.S. Constitution is um, somewhat difficult to change, like the amendment process takes very long and all that. And I see that, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I think that it's so interesting that compared with more modern constitutions, like the German Constitution, for example, like certain things can be changed in the American Constitution that can't be changed in foreign constitutions, like for example, we don't have certain rights ingrained that a lot of people think we do that are, say, listed in the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. um, that could be technically, probably won't be, but technically could be reversed with simply adding another amendment, just the way we changed the drinking age, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think it would be, I mean, do you think that that's a normatively good thing, that we don't have cert certain sections, I guess, ingrained that can't be changed in the US Constitution? And do you think that if we were to have another constitutional convention that anything would become static that just can't be changed at all? Well, if the notion is to have a document that is supposed to express the will of the people, I mean, the will of the people can be changed over time. So I, I wouldn't, I can't imagine, I mean, I, I wouldn't think that there would be provisions that, um, that under no circumstances if, if, if they were the will of the people, couldn't be incorporated into the document. I, I don't know the German constitution. What, are you, what well, thing that is, well, can't be changed? Like I think that they have more human rights provisions um, than, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what. Oh, which, I'm, you're saying could there, like, could there like be different understandings rights, about what could be a right? Right, exactly. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, I mean, and 
again, this is an instance where uh, I'm thinking of the Rodriguez case. Uh, people are talking about wealth as uh, a suspect classification. The, the court basically says that there's no, I mean, fundamental right to, you know, to a particular <coughs> level of, of, of income or whatever. I mean, the wealth is not a suspect classification. That, that would be something, if the people wanted to change the American Constitution, they would put it out there and to say that, you know, you have a right to health care, you have a right to various things, that could be done uh, through the amendment process. Uh, we could do that. Uh, it's not likely <laughs> to come to fruition, but what I'm getting at is that courts, back to what I said before about people trying to, you know, in the, the Rodriguez decision, I think it was five to four. So it was an instant, instance where the court was trying to infer those things, penumbras, that's a, a phrase that they use, things that are not specifically there, but we can kind of gauge that they're there. The court has tried to do that. But if people wanted to do it explicitly, it could definitely be done, but that's a political question. You would have to put it out there, um, say, you know, everybody has a right to health care, for example, or everybody has a right to a certain level of, you know, income or whatever, you, you know, whatever right that you think might uh, might be appropriate, you would have to go through the political process to do that. That could be done, definitely, instead of having, as I said before, the courts, you know, trying to interpret, w interpret this into uh, a, a real right. Hey, I'm a uh, Matt. I'm a Matt, I'm a 15 Gov major. Um, so I, I feel like a big point that you're stressing here is that the Constitution should express the will of the people and that the people should become more involved either through a possible co constitutional convention or through increased participation mm -hmm. just in the general process. And so I'm just kind of wondering, I feel like a major point in the Constitution was preventing the tyranny of the majority and not allowing majority rule to have such a large place in society. Mm -hmm. But with your comment about Thomas Jefferson feeling that it should be reevaluated every 20 years, I'm, I'm not too sure where, what, where I should stand there. So just kind of, A, what do you think? Like, do you think I'm wrong in assuming that the founding fathers did kind of want to put in these stops against majority rule? Mm -hmm. And to what degree do you think that, if it is, do you think it kind of should be a part of our Constitution? Well, I mean, yes. I mean, the, the Bill of Rights is a check on, on uh, certainly something like the Fifth <coughs> Amendment uh, you know, takings clause or whatever. There, yeah, you did not want, I mean, they did not want a tyranny of the majority. You want to protect the rights of minority people. But the notion is that majority, majorities do matter. So long as you're not doing things that infringe upon people's rights, basic rights, um, we do have a system of majority rule. Um, I think that one thing I didn't mention um, that I should have mentioned is that certainly the role of money in politics has sort of, in, in terms of what is majority rule and, and whose rule is really uh, at play here, uh, is something that's relative, is something that's new in the system as well. So. When I'm I'm count I'm using people power people votes people's power to vote as a counterweight because the court has said that money is speech um, that you people who don't have money have to have a way of counterbalancing the interests of, of people who do so yeah I, I do think that with due protection of minority rights and certainly the court that's when the court comes in and says it, it's all line drawing law is all line drawing that you can go this far, but you can't go beyond that because that is an infringement. But the general principle that the will of the people is expressed through their vote, uh, expressed through their opinions to their representatives, is something that should be paramount. I, I, I stand by that so long as you don't go too far. And too far is what the court is there to make the determination about. In the back. I'm Max Lu. I'm a 17. I'm also from Texas. And I really enjoyed your lecture, but on the part about the post-Civil War Constitution and specifically 
the 14th Amendment, you mentioned the Privileges and Immunities Clause, but not the Due Process Clause. I left that out, I'm and, sorry. Uh, right, but as recently as 2010 in McDonald v. Chicago, this, the courts basically rejected privileges and immunities in favor of substantive due process. Mm -hmm. So my question for you is, how significant do you think that clause really is now? I think they should bring it back. It, it was gutted with the slaughterhouse cases, really, in the, in the 1860s. Um, I, like, I, I think that Bingham intended it to have much more power than it, it has. And that's the great thing about the flexibility of the court. I mean, we have stare decisis where you're not supposed to change things quickly. But I, for one, would like to see the Privileges and Immunities Clause being interpreted much more broadly because I think the original intent was to do that. But the, court, the courts did not. I mean, we had, a, we had the, these amendments, this part I said about law and power. Uh, we had these amendments put in place to bring blacks into citizenship. And, but you also had a Supreme Court at that time that was very, that was reactionary. And so they immediately went about gutting the Privilege and Immunities Clause in the Slaughterhouse cases and made it moribund, really. And people have said, you should bring it back. There are lots of, of those provisions. Uh, people are thinking now about using uh, the 13th Amendment, some of the language of the 13th Amendment to sort of broaden rights uh, when people think about uh, affirmative action, the, the part about badges and incidents of slavery, what you can do to try to get rid of that. So there are all these provisions that uh, at different points in history have differing resonance, the courts focus on or not, but you're right. I think it, it has not, well, even I said from Slaughterhouse, it's not been seen as on par with the Due Process Clause, the Equal Protection Clause. Most of the civil rights cases, all those things, due process and equal protection have been the mechanisms for those things, and privileges and immunities, eh, you know, it hasn't been used. But I think it should be brought back. Um, because I think it was originally intended to be a part of, a, of an all-encompassing way of transforming you know, the rights of freedmen, but it would apply to everybody as well, not just um, people who are, who are Africa, uh, of African-American descent. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.